and welcome to TV Bookshelf. I'm Dave Lenander, and today I'm talking with Jane Yolen. Jane is the queen of science fiction <laughs> and fantasy and children's books. And today I'd like to ask her about her long career with books, her, um, some of the different genres she's worked in. I'd like to ask her particularly about picture books, because I think that none of the other people we've talked to have had anything to say about picture books. And I'd like to talk about some of the exciting new projects, including some collaborations that she's working on. And so, I guess, let's start by saying some things about picture books. Um, I've probably published over 100 picture books. I love the form. I love the short form. Uh, for me, the idea of having two very distinct kinds of, of visions collaborating on a book, uh, somebody who thinks in words and somebody who thinks in pictures. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. And I always learn something more about my stories once I've seen them illustrated. Uh, I don't think I'll ever give up writing picture books, but the picture book market today is worse than it's been in the 40 years I've been publishing. I won't go into all the details about why it's terrible, mm -hmm. but the um, the beautifully written, beautifully illustrated picture book is not what they're looking for if it's quiet, if it's a, a one shot. In other words, it's not connected to a particular character over and over again, or a television show, or written by a celebrity. But the picture book itself is a genre. It is a, an artifact of um, of publishing that that even such things as novels are not because um, novels have been around longer than picture books. Picture books have had to come at a time when you could do a particular thing with a publishing with a print pr printing press. Mm -hmm. um, and now with laser printing, picture books should be at their most beautiful, their most exciting and uh, the marketplace is closing down, which is so sad. It is. I, I don't think people always realize just how much artistry goes into the picture books. And a few years ago, when I had the opportunity to look at some of your manuscripts at the University of Minnesota collections, I was so impressed with the work that you did refining yeah. the, um, the text. The problem with picture books is that even if they're not written in rhyme, they're not written as poems, they are poems. They have to be polished and polished and polished the way you do a poem. Whereas a novel, you can let some things slide. Mm -hmm. In 300, 400 pages, you can't ever get to polish it in quite the way you would polish a picture book. But every single word counts in a picture book. And so uh, I, who tend to be a rewriter, mm -hmm. not so much a writer, but a rewriter. I love revision. I love the process of revision. That becomes the place where you can have the most fun in a picture book, because you're going word by word by word. You read it out loud. Mm -hmm. um, you read it to the walls. You read it to your friends. You read it to your children. Um, and, and because you know that a picture book will be read aloud. That's what it's meant to be. That's what it's meant to be with a child on your lap. You read the book. If it doesn't work aloud, then it doesn't work. And it's certainly true that many parents read those books again and again and again. I apologize to a <laughs> lot of them. <laughs> well, actually, I think most of your books are so beautiful that it isn't, isn't so difficult. Um, the. Uh, I do remember you mentioning once a funny story about one of your picture books. I think it was Nikolaychuk was illustrating a book of yours, oh. and you had to change the text because he drew it backwards. Um, Charles Nikolaychuk, who was a brilliant artist, and I was so glad to finally work with him. Um, he was a good friend of mine for years. We worked on a picture book of the, uh, I retold the story of Tam Lin. Yes. And he, I sent him the um, the tartans for the clan I was talking about in the book. But by the time he got into it, 
he totally forgot what the tartans uh, were supposed to be, and he made up his own. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't find this out until I saw the full color paintings. By then it was too late for him to do anything because this girl was wearing a tartan that no one has ever seen in Scotland, ever. And so I had to write this charming little note at the end saying, you know that uh, artists are given leeway to invent their own <laughs> tartans. And I, I hope that it worked because there was nothing we could do at that point. Mm -hmm. But they're beautiful pictures. They're gorgeous pictures. They're just not Scottish tartans. And you know Scottish now since you now live part of the year in Scotland. I, for the last uh, 12 years, I've lived half time in Scotland, which is a place so full of stories and so full of history and the back end of the words history is story, of course, that when I'm there, I feel as if all these stories are, are rushing through me and into me and, and um, from one ear to the other. I mean, you cannot walk uh, along a path in Scotland without coming upon story. And some of those stories are being retold now, besides Tam Lin, you Well, some of them I've put in novels, some of them historical novels, some fantasy novels. Um, I have so many other ideas, but trying to get to them all, you know. I'm 66 now. I can't live forever, though I will try, uh, but I figure if I'm lucky, I'll have between 10 and 20 good writing years left. So I have to start thinking about which stories are crying out the most mm -hmm. to be told. When I was younger, I could say, oh, well, I'll get around to it. I need to get around to them now. I thought your story about the, um, is it Isabel, the Scottish um, woman who's put in a cage? Well, the, the young woman who's put in a cage uh, was um, uh, Jo, um, who was uh, the um, daughter of uh, Robert the Bruce. Robert the Bruce. Isabel was Isabel of Buchan, who was also put in a cage. She was the young woman about 19 years old who was the Countess of Buchan, who crowned Robert the Bruce. And Robert the Bruce's, one of his sisters was also put in the cage by the wicked King Longshanks, Edward Longshanks, Edward the First. And the idea that he would put these women in cages, the older two, he, the cages were hung up on the sides of castles so that there was a little ruled off place where they would have their toilet, but the rest of the, if they wanted to be not stuck in there with the mm -hmm. privy, they had to be in the outside. They were brought in at night, but the rest of the time they were buffeted by the winds uh, that were buffeting the castle walls. Um, the child, who was about 12 at the time, or wa Robert the Bruce's daughter, was put in a cage for about two weeks, not one that was hung up on the walls, just sort of mm -hmm. sitting around. And there was such a hue and cry about how can you do this to you know a, a young girl? That the king relented and put her into a nunnery for eight years uh, when Robert the Bruce won mm -hmm. the war. We don't know anything more than that, just that she was probably put in that cage for two weeks and then put into a nunnery. And so my co-writer, Robert J. Harris, who's a mm -hmm. Scot, and I wove the story around those few facts that we had, um, and uh, it's a fascinating period. It's a fascinating book, too, and it's just horrifying to think about the things that were done. Well, maybe they're not so War unique. War is yeah. horrifying, and um, I mean, we also did a book, he and I did a book about uh, the Battle of Culloden uh, and Bonnie Prince Charlie, and that was horrible, too. I mean, war is horrible. No one has anything good to say about war, uh, but but in order to write about about it, I mean, I've written two Holocaust novels. I've written four. Uh, I'm working on the fourth book um, in Scotland that all deal with wars of one kind or another. I did a fantasy novel called The Wild Hunt, which is about a kind of war. Yes, uh, between uh, the forces 
you could say of good and evil, but it's really more the forces of winter and summer, um, and two children who get caught up in this, in this battle. And it's never pleasant. And to write a book, especially for young people, that seems to say that you know, war is a good idea would be immoral. Um, wars sometimes happen for good reasons, but it's never pleasant, and there are immoral things that happen on both sides, always. Mm -hmm. You've um, more recently branched out into writing for adults, of course, and you wrote um, the beautiful novel, Briar Rose, and earlier Cards of Grief, and uh, then the fascinating stories about the women in the Dells or Dales. Dales, Dales, yeah. Um, I keep getting letters from kids saying, I've looked in the encyclopedia and I can't find anything about the Dales. Can you tell me where they are? And I have to <laughs> say, I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> that, but it's always distressing. But, but they are so realistic. And I think part of, um, of the realism comes from the way that you've built the story, reaching back to a myth, retelling it as a story, making songs, little poems, and then giving us narratives as well. It's, it's kind of like Tolkien building all mm -hmm. that background. Mm -hmm. uh, you do it a lot more economically and, and at a much shorter length. Well, because I tend <laughs> to be a short story <laughs> writer. But um, I've always thought those books were, were uh, amazing. And, and Thank you. Uh, and, and of course, I think one of your best books is Merlin's books, which I think is just magnificent. Sort of a series of meditations on the Arthurian stories and Merlin. And um, I find the character of Merlin the most interesting in the Arthurian cycle because he is both a wizard and a trickster. Mm -hmm. He's both a good guy and a bad guy. He's older than most of the main characters, so he has a kind of wisdom, but it's a wisdom that has been tainted in some ways by his magic and enlivened by his magic as well. But he's also a character who knows, because he has foreknowledge, that he's not going to be in the story very much longer. And um, so he's always been the one that's fascinated me the most. Uh, he's also fascinated a number of other mm -hmm. writers, T.H. White and um, people like that, because he is so mysterious and so full of an odd magic. He is both pagan and Christian. He is both old and new. He is all of those. Um, he is very oppositional. And there's nothing more interesting to a, a novelist or a short story writer than an oppositional character. Most heroes and heroines are kind of bland. Mm -hmm. And the people who interest you the most are the ones who you can find those sort of odd nooks and crannies in their personalities. I think one of the things I loved about that book was that you were able to have so many, div by doing a series of short stories, which are not even in the mm -hmm. same universe, but they're all built on the same myths. Right. But the myths themselves contain oppositions and conflicts mm -hmm. and disagreements. Mm -hmm. And so by exploring it in that way, you were able to bring all of that stuff together. And I'm, I'm not sure how many people really read that book and think about it quite that way. But I think that there's an accumulated power of thinking about this in different ways that probably helps all of us to think about Well, I was so ways. fascinated as I, as I did those stories that I realized that, in fact, Many of those stories had more to them than I had. So I turned several of them into novels. I mean, yes. um, The Dragon's Boy became a novel. Right. Um, then I wrote the Young Merlin trilogy. And the first two books, Passager and Hobby, come directly out of two of those short stories. And then there's a story in there called The Sword and the Stone, which turned out to be um, my long time, 20 years working on novel um, called The Sword of the Rightful King. So that one book of short stories written for adults mm -hmm. ended up being um, one, three, four, five novels 
that I wrote of Deb Agbert. I call, tell people I'm an, al I'm an mm -hmm. Arthaholic because I love the Arthur mythos so much. But I think I've done it now. Well, Sort of the Right Book came, came out the last year. A year and a half and ago, the paperback, two years ago. Two years ago, and the paperback came out later last year. That's right. Um, you, uh, can you say something more about that book? That book was so hard for me to write because I kept starting it in the wrong place. Because I already had this short story, I thought that's where I had to start. And nothing was clicking. And I'd go over it and I'd lengthen the short story into kind of a, um, a novella and a novelette, but it was still starting it at the wrong place. And finally, with an editor's help, he kept saying, I need to know more, I need to know more. Start earlier, earlier. And suddenly it all came together. But the two characters that I like best in the story are Merlin and Morgaus, who is the Morgan Le Fay character, mm -hmm. because she is as oppositional as he. But where he has all positive oppositional attributes, she has all negative oppositional attributes. And that so the two of them balance each other as well. But she was such fun to write because she is the mother from hell. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the book now starts with one of her sons, Gawain, going, uh, know, knowing he's been summonsed by her, going up to her room. He's a, he's a, um, a teen. He's 18 now. He's just, tur just, just turning 18. He's a man. But he, she still gets him. She still gets to him every time because she's a woman of great power and she's a, she's a devouring mother. Mm -hmm. And you see him going up the stairs, you see him going to knock on the door. He finally gets up the nerve, he knocks on the door, <laughs> and she's not even there. And I just had such fun with that, um, that uh, it's, it's one of those passages I like to read when I'm doing readings. I can understand that. Um, Let's talk about poetry a little bit more, yeah. because I think that's, as we've already implied, one of your great strengths. Being such a fine poet, you bring that, that focus on language to everything you write. Well, um, I began as a poet um, and a journalist. A journalist in order to pay the bills, a poet in order to pay the hardback. Mm -hmm. But I found out after college that I wasn't really I was writing adult poetry, and I wasn't really very good at it because I don't like the, I, I'm not comfortable with the poetry, the confessional poetry of pain, which was when I graduated in 1960, was what was going on in the adult poetry world. Um, it was sort of like the Sylvia Plath era. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I had liked my mother and father, you know, <laughs> want to go there. Um, and. I felt that there were some things that I was not about to expose to the world in my poetry. So there was no place for the kind of poetry I wanted to write, which was very mythic. No one was writing mythic poetry in, mm -hmm. in, in that time, really. So I put my poetry away. And what happened was it came out in the fairy tales I started writing. So my fairy tales became very poetic and my poetry became my fairy tales. And it wasn't until 10, 15 years later that I discovered, really, that the whole idea of mythos um, and writing mythic poetry was a possibility. Parabola Magazine was one of the first places ah. that started publishing some of my mythic poetry. And uh, that was quite exciting because it was a um, and still is, a very interesting journal. Um, but, but up till that time, the time I stopped writing my poetry for adults and I started writing poetry for adults again, I'd been writing children's poetry. And my whole attitude towards poetry had changed. I was no longer writing um, agonies, which I didn't want to write. I was writing positives. I was writing joyful. I was, I was looking at the world very differently. So for me, writing fairy tales and writing children's poetry changed the way I was looking at the world mm -hmm. and also changed the way I was 
looking at my own writing. It made an enormous difference. So that when I went back to writing adult poetry, though there were still some dark moments in it, those dark moments very often leavened with, with um, lighter insights or more positive insights. Until a few years ago, when my husband, um, at that point of 40 years, had uh, developed cancer. Um, and he had a, um, a skull-based tumor, enormous skull-based tumor, was inoperable. And he went through 43 days of radiation. I couldn't write except for a single sonnet a night after I took care of him and fed him and, and made sure he had you know, whatever medication, got him to bed, tucked him in, made sure he was breathing, just the way you do with a little child, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I had maybe an hour for myself in the whole day. And I went up to my writing room, which is in the attic, and I wrote a sonnet. And I wrote a sonnet a day for 43 days, for me. Mm -hmm. Because it was a way of structuring the day, holding on to it, um, understanding that though I had no power in affecting what was happening to him, that was the doctor's role, mm -hmm. I did have some power to affect what was happening within me. And that power translated into the 14 lines of a sonnet. I never expected the poems to be published. I was writing them for myself. But my writer's group said, you must get these published. And the very first poem is a mythic poem. Mm -hmm. It's about um, saying to your, to your loved one, um, I will go with you. I will go down and take you from death and bring you back up into the light, and I will not look back. So it you know, references Orpheus mm -hmm. and Eurydice. And, and from there on, I just, I just kept writing. Your husband's bird watching informed one of your most famous books, Owl Moon. Right. Um, and I know that in many ways he's helped you and supported you with, with your writing. You've told me before about his, his helping you once when the editors kind of fell down on the job and he had to fill in to... He's, he's been wonderful. He's been that immediate second eye who reads what I write, is honest with me, but caring. Um, and, uh, and also, he taught me to see. I grew up in New York City, uh, where everything is those sharp, um, those sharp verticals. He grew up in West Virginia, where there are some sharp verticals in the mountains, but there are also vistas. And he knows how to see. He knows how to see birds. He knows how to see trees. He knows how to see um, streams. And I learned it from him. And that has informed a lot of what I write because I'm able to reference things that I had no knowledge of before. Um, we can be driving along in the car and he'll say, did you see that? And I go, what? And I haven't seen it because he sees more out of the corners of his eyes mm -hmm. than I can see straight on. But I've learned and all our children are great bird watchers and are really very at ease in, a, in an outdoor setting. They really are more comfortable even than I, than mm -hmm. I am because they were brought up that way. And you have incredibly talented children and you have collaborated them with all of them, I think, That's on right. writing projects right. now. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? In the well, my daughter later? Heidi is, um, is a writer and a poet. Um, she and I have done about eight or ten books together. Um, we've done a series called the Unsolved Mysteries from History. Um, we've done five of those books. The fifth one is, is yet to come out. But we've also, we also did a book called Mirror, Mirror, 40-story folktales for mothers and daughters to share, um, in which we use the, the folktales for a jumping off place to discuss our lives. Um, we just, just had come out um, the Barefoot Book of Ballet Stories, the Retold Ballet Stories. We have about four more books under contract. 
and now she's writing, she's just finished writing her first picture book. Mm -hmm. Jason is a photographer, he's the youngest, um, and he and I have done uh, ten books together where I wrote poetry to his photographs. And then Adam, who is a musician and lives here in the Twin Cities, um, he uh, and I have started a series of novels, young adult novels called The Rock and Roll Fairy Tales. The first one will be out this summer. It's called Play the Piper. And it's a modern take on the Pied Piper of Hamelin. The second one, Troll Bridge, is a modern take on the um, Three Billy Goats Grow Up. And then he's just sold his own first novel. And we've written many short stories together as well. So yeah, they're incredibly talented. Uh, it would be nice if one of them had been a banker or a venture capitalist, <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm very pleased. I told them that the only thing I thought that I wanted from them is that they leave the world a better place than they found it, and I think they're doing that. And you've certainly been doing that. Um, and you, you certainly have some books of your own coming out, um, as well as perhaps other collaborations. And uh, Pay the Piper is coming out. Um, I did also with um, Patrick Nielsen Hayden, we started the uh, year's best fantasy and science fiction for teens. Oh, so okay. there's not been one of those. So the first one will be out in May. Um, we're doing, um, I'm uh, working on the fourth book of the Pit Dragon trilogy. I know. Really? There aren't four books in a trilogy. So now they're calling it the Pit Dragon Chronicles. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're going to box the first three, and now I'm 100 pages into the next book. And I hope to finish it. Um, by fall. Okay. I think it's going to be called Dragon's Heart. I'm not positive. Okay. Uh, do you have any more adult uh, novels in? I have two adult novels I want to write, but not yet. Not yet. Yeah. We didn't really talk about your short stories, except incidentally, as part of your fairy tales. But you've written hundreds of short yes, stories. Yes. Yeah. I have a. I have a. a novelette coming out that I wrote with Medora Snyder um, and another it's called Except the Queen and a short story that Adam and I wrote that um, is going to come out uh, in about a year year and a half called Little Red it's about it's a Little Red Riding Hood I heard that <laughs> <laughs> yes that's a little tough and then um, I have a story coming out in the Worldcon book this year the book itself is called Nova Scotia because it's about about Scottish stories, and mine is called um, A Knot of Toads, because a collection of toads mm -hmm. is called A Knot oh. of Toads. Well, I'd like to thank you for talking with us today. And, uh, I really appreciate this chance to see you again, and you, I'm glad that uh, people thank are able you. to hear about your books. Thank you.